Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at our virtual reality naloxone training simulation webinar. As many of you know, we are thrilled to partner with Walmart to present this unique virtual reality training experience. We initially launched this simulation back in February 2020 at CACA's National Leadership Forum. We then engage with many of our incredible coalitions to learn how our communities can host events using this technology. We had great initial feedback, including how to use this VR tool as a standalone awareness event, create a training around it, and or add it to trainings that are already being held. Today, we've held more than 20 virtual screening events. We've engaged thousands of participants and we look forward to hosting more events in the coming year and engaging countless new participants. Today, we are thankful for you, our amazing CACA members and guests, and would of course like to express our gratitude to our partners at the Fort Bend Community Prevention Coalition and Fort Bend Regional Council for their partnership in creating this event and for hosting us today. Before I kick this off to hear from our esteemed group of speakers, I want to let everyone know the goals for today. First, we will hear from a wonderful group of speakers here in Texas who are working every day to save lives. We are honored for them to be part of this event. Then we will view a virtual reality simulation developed by Walmart that demonstrates a few different scenarios on how to recognize when an overdose is happening and how to administer naloxone. From these events, we plan to learn how to use this technology to better save lives and create a norm that every life is worth saving. Now, I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, CACA's Chief of Staff, Valentino Murphy. Valentino joined our team in 2021 and has been working ever since to help further CACA's mission of building and maintaining safe and healthy drug-free communities. We are thrilled to have him here with us at CACA and appreciate him being here today to speak with us. Valentino. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here for this very important event. First and foremost, I want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Walmart, their commitment to investing in this technology, and more importantly, in the people whose lives will be positively impacted by this life savings training is truly commendable. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to our friends and supporters at the Fort Bend Community Prevention Coalition. I consider it an honor to be on with such impressive leaders from my former home in Katy, Texas. My wife and I have family in the area and visit often. My personal thanks for all you do. Finally, I want to thank everyone on today's webinar. CACA has a footprint in over 30 countries worldwide and more than 5,000 coalitions across the United States. We seek to train community residents and leaders to build and develop coalitions in their communities and reduce substance misuse by adapting CACA's model for community change. CACA knows that the prevention of substance use and misuse before it starts is the most cost-effective and cost-efficient way to reduce substance misuse. It's more important to emphasize that prevention is more crucial than ever before. Recently, the CDC reported that over 109,000 drug overdose deaths occurred in the United States in 2022. This number may have leveled off since we experienced the highest number of overdose deaths, but there is still plenty of work to be done, and the CDC anticipates this numbers to rise as data comes in. To put it in perspective, that number could fill Smart Financial Center in Sugarland 17 times over. It's a tragic reality, and we must do everything in our power to address it. Together we are stronger, and as we train substance use and misuse prevention to coalitions every day of the year all across the world, it's crucial that we have leaders and community stakeholders like yourselves fully engaged and committed. You are true heroes in your communities, driving positive change. We need to continue to raise our voices on this in unity. Our partners at the Drug Enforcement Administration launched their One Pill Can Kill campaign which aims to raise awareness about fentanyl-laced pills that are, are killing so many fellow Americans. The DEA's message then is the same now. If you did not receive your medication from your licensed pharmacist, do not take it. 
We have seen what one pure lace with fentanyl can do, and we do not need to see any more lives lost. As DEA Administrator Ann Milgram shared at CACA's 2023 National Leadership Forum to over 4,000 coalition members, this is not a war on drugs, but a fight to save lives. We also need to be vigilant of trends popping up in our communities. Our partners at the Office of National Drug Control Policy have identified xylazine as a key emerging threat, and it's one which interacts with opioids in a devastating way that leads to overdose death. Example of this spread of this dangerous trend, some cities are reporting that drug samples they are receiving rarely contain heroin, while 99% of them contain fentanyl, and four out of five samples contain xylazine. In this current landscape, we need every available tool to save lives and help our communities recover from this drug crisis. So please keep up the exceptional work you are doing. I look forward to seeing you in person the next time we are all together. Thank you for having me on today. Thank you for those remarks, Valentino. We appreciate you joining us. And now we're excited to share with you special remarks from Senator John Cornyn. John Cornyn was first elected to the U.S. Senate in 2002 and is currently serving his fourth term. He sits on the Senate Finance, Intelligence, and Judiciary Committees, where he helps to craft legislation on behalf of more than 30 million Texans. From 2013 until 2019, Senator Cornyn was chosen by his colleagues to serve as the Republican whip the second highest ranking position in the Senate Republic Conference. A San Antonio native, Senator Cornyn has served the people of Texas for nearly four decades. As a district judge, a justice of the Texas Supreme Court, and as the Texas Attorney General before representing the Lone Star State in the U.S. Senate. In the Senate, Senator Cornyn has been a champion for CACA and substance use prevention for many years and was a recipient of CACA's Congressional Leadership Award in 2019. He serves on the Senate Caucus on International Narcotics Control, where he also previously served as the former chair and ranking member and in 2018 led the reauthorization of a range of key programs with the passage of the Substance Abuse Prevention Act. Earlier this year, the Senator introduced the Halting the Epidemic of Addiction and Loss, or HEAL Act, to expand access to opioid overdose reversal agents and the Fentanyl Safe Testing and Overdose Prevention Act. In November, Senator Cornyn joined the Senate Mental Health Caucus and successfully led the Senate to pass a resolution recognizing Red Ribbon Week. Senator Cornyn, thank you for sharing your time with us today. Hi, I'm Texas Senator John Cornyn. Fentanyl poisoning is a leading cause of death among Americans aged 18 to 45, and many victims have no way of knowing if a pill is laced with this deadly drug. I recently introduced the Fentanyl Stop Act to increase access to fentanyl test strips that can save lives. I've also introduced legislation called the HEAL Act to expand access to new life-saving opioid overdose reversal agents in addition to naloxone. I'm hopeful these bills will help turn the tide of this crisis, and I'm grateful to the Fort Bend Regional Council for raising awareness in the Houston area. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Senator Cornyn, for your consistent support for CACA and our coalitions. And of course, thank you for bringing sensible solutions to Capitol Hill and leading these key legislative efforts that will save so many American lives. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Latasha Gail Lowe. Dr. Gail Lowe serves as the Director of Fort Bend County Health and Human Services. Dr. Gail Lowe brings to Fort Bend County a unique passion for addressing substance abuse, misuse in undeserved communities and educating providers on the importance of identifying the signs of prescription drug misuse. In her work, Dr. Gail Lowe draws from more than 20 years medical experience as a practicing family physician treating vulnerable, under-resourced populations. As she engages with community stakeholders in Fort Bend County to reduce loss of life, Dr. Gail Lowe is intently focused on strategies for education, prevention, and awareness. 
Dr. Gail Lowe, we are so excited to hear from you. Hi, I'm Dr. Latasha Gail Lowe, Director and Local Health Authority for Fort Bend County Health and Human Services. I am delighted to join CODCA at the invitation of Fort Bend Regional Council to highlight Fort Bend County Health and Human Services commitment to addressing and ultimately ending substance abuse and misuse epidemic. This significant public health issue requires sustained and intentional commitment from all sectors of our society to reverse the recent trend that has affected many portions of our communities. Recent 2023 county health rankings list Fort Bend County as number four out of 244 counties as healthiest. While this is an enviable status, it does not exempt Fort Bend County residents from the trends of increasing morbidity and mortality associated with opioid use. Fort Bend County has experienced a notable increase in opioid-related deaths over the past six years, and recent data further reveals a particularly alarming fact. The percentage of opioid deaths related to fentanyl has surged from 42% in 2019 to a staggering 79% in 2022. This crisis does not discriminate. Those who are generally impacted are younger males from diverse backgrounds, educational levels, and ethnicities. Importantly, these trends are not isolated just here to Fort Bend County. They align with the broader patterns seen across the region and the state. Fentanyl has emerged as the driving force behind this devastating rise in opioid-related deaths. Nevertheless, it is not a challenge we face alone. We are in this together with all levels of leadership from local to state, collaborating alongside community-based organizations like the Fort Bend Regional Council. We have fostered longstanding partnerships with community partners where we provide engagement and support in various ways, whether through letters of support or participating on panel discussions for drug prevention and treatment initiatives. This commitment extends even during difficult times, such as the height of COVID-19 pandemic through Fort Bend Regional Council Drug Symposiums. Our involvement in planning and implementation of a 1115 uh, waiver grant from 2011 to 2019 has been pivotal. With this grant, we uh, partnered again with our partner here in the community, Fort Bend Regional Council, to participate in stakeholder planning meetings and quarterly updates with a particular focus on diversion activities. The recognition that substance abuse and misuse can interfere with a patient's ability to participate in a medical plan was a key insight. And as part of the second round of 1115 waiver funding, Fort Bend Regional County and Fort Bend County Health and Human Services teamed up to develop screening brief intervention and referral for treatment program for Access Health, a local FQHC. This initiative marked a significant milestone in our journey to provide referrals for timely and effective care for local residents in Fort Bend County. Our dedication to this cause extends to supporting various community grants and initiatives such as Fort Bend Regional Council's Mental Health Training Grant, Partnership for a Success Grant for Youth Substance Abuse Diversion, and the STOP Act grants to address underage drinking. Over the past two decades, Fort Bend County Health and Human Services has actively supported grant applications and initiatives addressing substance abuse prevention and education with our local independent school districts. Now, a new chapter unfolds as we look to the future of addressing substance abuse in Fort Bend County. Our Department of Health and Human Services has worked to establish an official epidemiology division, which empowers us with tools of surveillance to collect, analyze, and disseminate data, which reinforces our commitment to evidence-based decision-making. We have a great foundation from building community partnerships, providing fast medical intervention through emergency medical service initiatives using Narcan, and reaching countless individuals grappling with opioid substance abuse disorder through referrals to our local FQHC programs. However, we do understand that our journey is just the beginning. 
And with the recent release of opioid settlement funds to Fort Bend County local government, we are poised to partner to continue our work to expand partnerships and to provide staff training to drive down the number of opioid-related deaths. Fort Bend County is facing an opioid crisis, but it is a crisis we are committed to addressing collaboratively, comprehensively, and with a determination to make a lasting impact. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gail Lowe. We are so excited to see the public health leadership you will bring to Fort Bend County and appreciate your hearty support of community prevention. Next, we will hear from Wendell Campbell. Wendell Campbell is the Drug Intelligence Officer for the Houston High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, or HITTA. Prior to HITTA, Wendell Campbell served as a DEA special agent for over 25 years, retiring from the DEA division office in December, 2018. During his career as a DEA special agency, Wendell was assigned to numerous enforcement groups, such as the DEA mobile enforcement team, major drug squads, and organized crime strike force. Over the span of his career with the DEA, Wendell completed deployments in Bolivia and Guatemala and additionally served as the DEA public information officer handling all media related matters. As a special agent and public information officer, Wendell worked collaboratively and engaged with various stakeholders throughout the Houston region. Wendell has worked hand in hand with community resource groups and served as part of the University of Texas Drug Pop Institute, providing opioid education materials, briefings and education on drug trafficking trends that impact Texas communities. Wendell holds a bachelor's and master's degree in management. Further, Wendell is a graduate of the DEA's Advanced Agent Training in Quantico as well as a graduate of U.S. Army Training for Operation Snowcap. He is a certified DEA trauma member where he provided psychological and physical victim assistance and is a certified instructor for the Department of Justice. Officer Campbell, please take it away. Well, thank you for the introduction and this opportunity. Um, first of all, I want to just give a big thank you to the Fort Bend Regional Council for all their efforts in serving the citizens of Fort Bend County, but also how they reach out to surrounding counties and really support a lot of other programs and help other organizations uh, duplicate themselves and better serve their communities as well. So big shout out to Fort Bend County Regional Council. Also, CADCA, can't say enough good things about CADCA. This past year, I was able to attend the event in Dallas and it was fantastic. Uh, great uh, programs, uh, information. It was just an amazing investment in so many people and, and, and really helping build people up. And so I want to thank you for everything that CADCA does as well. Well, um, once again, my name is Wendell Campbell. I'm a retired special agent with DEA. I'm now the drug intelligence officer with Houston Haida. And um, uh, so that begs the question, well, what is Haida? I get that question quite often. Well, Haida is the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program. It was actually set into place by Congress in 1988 as a tool to help support federal, state, and local law enforcement with their enforcement programs and help uh, reduce the trafficking of illicit drugs on the streets. But in addition to that, though, Haida has really expanded also into drug education, demand reduction for drugs, harm reduction training, naloxone training, and so forth. So, so Haida has really partnered with a lot of agencies to help expand their impact on local communities to help reduce drug use and make our communities safer. Uh, when you look at Haida as a whole, there's 33 regional Haidas around the nation that covers over 600 counties. And that really encompasses the vast amount of of population here in the United States uh, with the footprint of Haida helping serve those local communities. As you'll see on the screen here, here's a quick picture of the Houston Haida region. It covers 18 counties from Louisiana almost down to uh, Mexico, where we're just one county shy of Mexico with Brooks and uh, Kennedy County being the lower counties there to the south. Uh, we have 18 counties total once again 
Fort Bend, Brazoria, Harris County being some of our bigger counties along with Montgomery County. And, and we have a large amount of drug flow coming out of Texas into our region. So what's our current reality in our nation? Well, our current reality is this, is that fentanyl is the leading cause of death for individuals 18 to 45 years old in the United States. Fentanyl. So think about this. We have a drug that's being manufactured by individuals in a foreign country, and they are shipping it into our nation at such a high rate that it's become the number one cause of death for individuals 18 to 45 years old. You literally have a larger chance of dying from fentanyl statistically than you do a car wreck if you're between 18 and 45 years old. We have a lethal and non-lethal overdose every five minutes here in the United States uh, as a nation. Uh, that's a incredible statistic to look at. In addition to that, we have about 300 overdoses, 300 each and every day that are lethal. So with that thought in mind, how did we get here? Well, if you go back to 2000, 2005, 2010, and 12, and so forth, we see a big misuse of prescription drugs, uh, overprescribing. We see a lot of doctor shopping going on. Well, this fed right into illicitly manufactured fentanyl being shipped into the country as well, occurring in 2014, 15, 16, and it's escalated since then. Fentanyl was being mixed into heroin and so forth. And, and really, the reality is fentanyl, since it's hit the streets in the United States very harshly over the last 10 years, has changed everything. Fentanyl has changed everything. It's changed families. It's changed communities. It's changed school districts. And the loss of life has been staggering behind this one synthetic drug hitting the streets in the United States of America. Behind it, the way it's being distributed is through fake pills and counterfeit pills. Uh, many times pill presses are used, whether they're hand-pressed pills and or uh, machine-pressed pills. They're using the fentanyl powder itself to be put into each pill. It could be a, some type of fake pharmaceutical pill, such as an oxycodone pill, hydrocodone. It could be an Adderall pill. Unfortunately, many Adderall pills now are being laced with fentanyl as well, as well as Xanax and so forth. So we're seeing a lot of different type of fake or counterfeit pills hit the streets. Um, and now we're even seeing it in the form of what they call rainbow fentanyl out there. Now, with that thought in mind, what's been a response from Haida to this escalation of overdoses on the East Coast? What's been a, a response from uh, really the citizens uh, within communities? Well, one was we need to track overdoses better. And, and two is we need to reduce the amount of overdoses. And so our Washington, Baltimore, Haida from scratch designed a program called the OD map or what's really referred to as the overdose detection mapping application program or OD map. They developed this program working with public health and public safety, enrolled this program out to help better serve our local communities, track and, and, and identify overdoses in their local communities. We now have about 4,800 agencies participating around the nation uh, from a public health tool standpoint. Uh, really, what's the value that OD map brings to the market. Well, one of the great aspects to OD map is that it tracks near real time overdose information. It helps give those local public officials real time data on what's going on with overdoses in their local community. But uniquely, it also tracks lethal and non lethal overdoses. We've always done a really good job of tracking lethal overdoses. We haven't done such a great job tracking non-lethal overdoses. And now with this tool, we can do that at a higher rate. We can actually track it, keep an account of it, and we can see where there's a lot of non-lethal overdoses occurring, where naloxone might have been used to help save a life and or EMS just responded in the past to help somebody now it's being plotted and tracked. So we have time frames, days of week, and so forth. OD map breaks that down for local public officials to be able to see and read what's really going on in their community by tracking the data.
looking at those trends and upticks in local communities, it helps to identify new drug variants. Some new drug variants that we've seen hit the nation have been uh, what's referred to as the zombie drug or xylene hitting the streets quite a bit, as well as uh, natazines, a new classification of uh, synthetic opioids hitting the street as well. That's had a very negative effect on communities. So being able to track this kind of information concealed into one system really helps our our, our public uh, servants, our leaders make better decisions, helps them with public service announcements to get out in front of, of something occurring, to let the public know that there's been a rash of overdoses related to the pink fentanyl pills, so to speak, and they can put that information out there to the community. One of the best aspects to OD map, though, is that it's free. It's free to every public health, public safety agency out there. It's supported by uh, our Washington, Baltimore, HIDA. They are consistently doing upgrades uh, to help support the system, and it works just incredibly well uh, with the agency in their normal course of duty, which is fantastic. So it's not open to the general public. However, it's highly recommended that those local public health agencies and uh, public safety agencies work very closely with their drug coalitions and other community groups to help identify where these overdoses are and then bring resources such as harm reduction programs, um, naloxone distribution programs, maybe even a naloxone uh, vending machine to an area to help save lives in those areas. Also, uh, the program produces a weekly report, which is fantastic. This report uh, allows for public officials to break down the day a week time frame. It sh shows uh, the ebb and flow of overdoses in certain communities or areas so that public health can be better prepared to respond potentially to overdoses in that region with EMS and even patrol units and law enforcement having more naloxone on hand to respond to an overdose in an area. They also have a, a system that alerts uh, individuals um, within public health and public safety. It will, will actually um, send a, a system alert out to those local leaders. So our Washington, Baltimore, Haida will set up a system that when each agency across the nation sets up their spike alerts or, or a threshold number of, of, uh, of overdoses for an area, when it exceeds that, they'll get an email to help prompt them on awareness that overdoses are occurring at a higher rate in their area. As you look at this uh, shot here, this is a, a large kind of out view of the United States. You see a lot of bubbles and a lot of little diamonds around in different areas. This is just a quick snapshot of, of really overdoses. This is a quick shot of, of the Houston, Dallas, San Antonio area, with Houston being down in the lower right corner and, and Fort Bend County specifically. And then when you look at this shot here, this is a kind of a zoomed in shot of Houston, uh, and it really shows the overdoses that are occurring in our region. Um, there's a lot there's so much that Houston is city center of this. You just can't see it because of the overdoses plotted here. But it really gives public officials, uh, public safety, a better tool to really see what's going on so that we can respond better to those overdoses. So the question is, why OD map? Well, I get that question quite often. And I'll tell you this, from a tool perspective, a public health tool, it increases efficiency because you have agencies using the same system. Uh, public health, EMS, uh, public safety can track that overdose data, both lethal and non-lethal, which we were not tracking before that non-lethal overdose. When we have the non-lethal overdose, we can come in with harm reduction programs, educational efforts, uh, and, and really impact the community on a greater scale when we know where the non-lethal overdoses are occurring. And we can also help prevent and, and start lowering the deaths because we're taking better calculated action to better serve those communities. Lastly, the data collection is fantastic from ODMAP. It helps that local EMS chief or fire chief or public health director really have a better data set of what's going on and, and can make better use of resources for that particular county or, or community. In addition with that data, uh, it's very uh, useful from the perspective of being able to write for grants and so forth because now you've got documented data from the OD, OD map system.
So with that said, I want to thank you for your time and uh, thank you for uh, letting me walk you through just some highlights of ODM app and how we can use this tool to better serve our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Wendell, for your lifelong commitment to keeping our community safe and for such an excellent overview of drug trends and how our community leaders can work together for a more informed response. We appreciate your time and your insights. Today, we are also joined by Dr. Joy Alonzo. Dr. Alonzo is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacy Practice at the Texas A&M Irma Lerma Wrangell College of Pharmacy. Additionally, she is the Ambulatory Care Pharmacy Director for the Health for All Clinic in Bryan, Texas. One of her current assignments is as Director of Clinical Programs at Spring Outreach Services in Spring, Texas. In this role, Dr. Alonzo provides support, resources, and patient-centered interventions to youth and adolescents with substance use disorder and other mental and behavioral health challenges. She is a nationally certified instructor in adult and youth mental health first aid, and through Spring Outreach Services, she provides Mental Health First aid certification classes to students and community members. Dr. Alonzo combines her deep clinical experience with her specialized training in mental and behavioral health advocacy, policy, and community outreach, as well as the evaluation and oversight of psychotropic medication utilization in vulnerable populations. Dr. Alonso received her Master's of Engineering from Penn State and a doctoral degree in pharmacy from Howard University College of Pharmacy. Dr. Alonso, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Hello, my name is Dr. Joy Alonso, and I'm one of the co-chairs for the Texas A&M Opioid Task Force. Thank you for being here today. And I would like to talk to you about some of the youth and young adult oriented programs that we have at Texas A&M that we're working on uh, for the opioid crisis. Uh, recently, we've experienced in Texas and across the nation, some cluster outbreaks for, that are youth oriented uh, where a large number of youth and young adults are exposed to uh, opioid, ultra-potent opioids, illicit opioids very quickly. And we've even had one where there were 15 exposures at a high school in a very short span of time, about the first nine weeks of school for this school year. So we're developing a, a lot of interventions to try to address that issue and to develop an opioid response system for school districts. So one of the pieces of legislation that the state of Texas has passed in this past legislative session is uh, called HB 3908, it's called Tucker's Law. And uh, this is a, something that could have national relevance, but Tucker's Law specifies that in uh, the school districts in Texas at the middle school and high school level, there has to be available at least 10 hours of fentanyl specific evidence-based prevention education programming. This law went into effect September 1st of 2023. And so there really isn't any kind of opioid training programs that are school specific that meet all these objectives. So right now we're actually authoring and piloting a program that we call Teen Think Smart. And this program focuses on a couple of different issues. This Again, this is prevention, primary and secondary prevention education that's evidence-based and outcomes driven. So it is measurable. And we try to think about uh, getting kids to reflect and stop and think, uh, something that they're not used to doing. Their brains really aren't oriented about strategizing consequences to try to give them some executive processing skills. And then we have a lot of positive self-talk to empower them. And then additionally, we actually facilitate, not teach, but facilitate social simulations. And in these social simulations, the teens and young adults can practice 
refusal skills. And refusal skills are can be very many different many different flavors. For instance, they could be deflecting blame. I, I can't be here because my coach has, says that I have practice and I have to get going uh, and or using humor, uh, suggesting alternate activities. Well, let's just drive around or let's go over to see the movie, something like that. Or one of my favorites is an actual strategy to extract. Uh, this would uh, takes a lot of planning on the part of uh, the young adult or the youth. And they they what they do is text an emoji to a trusted individual at, you know, who's not at this social setting. And that person texts to another person. And then that person texts the youth or young adult and says, I have, there's been a medical emergency. Uh, somebody's been in a car accident. I have to come get you right away. And that way the teen has a way of getting out of the social setting where maybe misuse of a substance is escalating without having to out themselves relative to saying, hey, everybody's using, I want to go home. They don't, that, that isn't on their phone. And so they're not subject to ridicule or any of the social media targeting that they would undergo if, if that was uh, proven to be true. So the, it, it takes a lot of time and the kids themselves have to tell us what those authentic social simulations are. So that's why it's facilitated and not taught. There's a framework but the kids themselves are teaching us what the challenges that they're facing, and they are strategizing how to extract themselves from escalating misuse, which may lead to a really negative consequence, the most negative being overdose. So also, we also include age appropriate harm reduction uh, in, in this training. This is really important. These kids uh, have to have the capability to save themselves. So we do naloxone training for them. Now we don't issue kits without parental permission, especially for minors, uh, even though naloxone is over the counter. And of course, there are issues with naloxone rescue kits on campuses, high school and middle school campuses. Certainly a child probably can't walk around with that in their backpack, but they can have them at home and they can understand how to use them and they can have them in their car. So an age appropriate way to introduce this is to just give the mechanics of it, just the way you would teach an older youth or young adult how to engage in CPR. So that's called Team Think Smart, and we're actively piloting that right now uh, in several different school districts and studying the results and making modifications based on feedback uh, from the participants themselves. And additionally, there's a parent manual that's being produced to go along with it to explain the refusal skills so parents can be partners in developing these refusal skills in uh, the kids and young adults. Another big project that we have, another big innovative idea is the idea of meeting the kids where they are on social media. And one of the peer authored mess pieces of messaging, we're actually producing a teen uh, authored and teen produced drama, uh, which is called Split Second. This is a teen graphic novel. It's in three chapters. Chapter one is exposure, those social situations where the teens and young adults might find themselves where there may be a chance for exposure to escalating misuse of substances and how they strategize their way uh, out of it or don't. You know, what happens when somebody is actually unable to strategize their, their way out of it. So the, the fentanyl contaminated tablets are passed around, what happens next? Then the second chapter is an overdose event, and it's supposed to be an authentic representation of how uh, teens and young adults would experience an overdose event. And some of the kids actually survive this and some don't. So what is it like to have your friend overdose and what do you do? How do you respond? That it's going to be an authentic representation of an overdose event. And the third chapter, and probably the most important of this, is recovery. What are the what is what does recovery actually mean to a teen or to a young adult? What does that look like? What are those authentic experiences? What is it like to have to go to group therapy and individual therapy post overdose 
or post at being diagnosed with a, a opioid use disorder or a substance use disorder, what is that like? What is your mode of recovery? What's it like to take Suboxone as a kid? And it's FDA approved down to 16 years old. Uh, there are uh, providers uh, that uh, you know when you meet the criteria, you can be prescribed Suboxone to recover. What is that like as a kid? What is it like to engage with medical care under these circumstances? What's it like to be in uh, some kind of smart recovery program, an abstinence-based program? What's it like to be justice involved? What, are the, what, what is it like to be at an, an alternative high school or a recovery high school? What are those experiences authentically like? Which doors are still open that a person in recovery can still aspire to? And which doors are closed? You know, what kinds of, what kinds of uh, consequences are there for you as you progress uh, through your recovery? Uh, and it, it, is your recovery successful? It's a chronic relapsing disease state. Uh, can you maintain recovery? And how, what does that look like? What are the challenges day to day for youth and young adults. So that's another really innovative product that's gonna be produced and released on Instagram. And again, it's gonna be, it, it, it's critical that it's authentic teen voices. Uh, there are going to be interaction points for consumers of this, this information with QR codes where they can get more information. Uh, there's access points where they can uh, provide what they think about the content. Uh, how they feel about the content. Does the, count, does the content provide them with more skills? Is the content an authentic representation? And there's also for more information type uh, direction to direct them to other resources and especially to uh, treatment resources for them. So this is, these are some of the ideas that uh, we're, we're developing. Uh, another aspect of our work is uh, supporting the school districts in uh, with a piece of legislation that requires all school districts to have uh, naloxone rescue kits on campus and all middle and high school campuses. And uh, that might seem like a simple thing, but actually that requires policy at the school board level and then an administrative protocol for each of the school clinics, the health clinics, and represent, represent certifications for the nurse, school nurses and school healthcare workers to ensure that everybody has the same certification and everybody has the same understanding of what an opioid overdose looks like and how to respond. And so we've been supporting schools to develop these pro this programming and making sure that uh, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and they feel comfortable with managing the locks on, on campuses and some of the best practices associated with that, for instance, extending naloxone rescue kits to transportation uh, individuals on for first aid kits on buses and for athletic trainers and basically anywhere where a first aid kit would occur. And we're doing this on college campuses too. Uh, one of the best implementations I've seen lately is with uh, Sam Houston State University and uh, the University of Texas at Austin where the naloxone rescue kits actually exist uh, everywhere on campus, where everywhere there's an AED, everywhere where there's a first aid kit, and everywhere uh, actually in the lox boxes outside. So they're very, very accessible uh, to individuals as they need them in an emergent situation. So thank you so much for listening to this presentation. If you have any questions about any of the interventions that are being developed at Texas A&M, please do contact me. My name is Dr. Joy Alonzo, and I'm at jalonzo1 at tamu.edu. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Alonzo, for being with us here today and for your engagement in so many initiatives serving the community. And now we are so lucky today to be able to hear from today's host and dynamic leader in community-based prevention, Payal Patani. Payal is the director of the Fort Bend Community Prevention Coalition, having served the Fort Bend Regional Council in this role since 2015. She holds a bachelor's degree in health education and promotion from the University of Houston and an advanced certified prevention specialist certification from the Texas Certification Board. 
Payal is recognized as a leader at the local, state, national, and institutional levels for her ability to prevent and reduce drug and alcohol use among youth and young adults. Her leadership to the Fort Bend Community Prevention Coalition being recognized by the Office of National Drug Control Policy for outstanding collaborative efforts in preventing substance use among youth. Payal, we're so excited for you to share about your work. Hi, I am Payal Fatani Stafford, Fort Bend Community Prevention Coalition. Thank you for joining us today to discuss the opioid overdose crisis and resources available in the community to prevent and reduce the crisis. It is a problem that requires collective attention. For Ben Community Prevention Coalition, FBCPC, a program of Forbin Regional Council, has been working in the community to prevent and reduce opioid crisis through education, advocacy, collaboration, and community outreach. Members of FBCPC have been implementing a comprehensive program to raise awareness about the dangers of opioid misuse. This involves not only informing the public, but also educating healthcare professionals, educators, and community leaders. By fostering a deeper understanding of the risk associated with opioids, we empower individuals to make informed decisions and identify warning signs in themselves and others. For example, FBCPC has trained over 500 community members to administer naloxone, a life-saving medication to reverse opioid overdose. Furthermore, FBCPC actively promotes responsible prescribing practices. We collaborate with healthcare providers to establish guidelines that prioritize non-opioid alternatives for pain management whenever possible through our Know Your Options campaign. By encouraging more cautious approach to prescribing opioids, we contribute to a reduction in the overall availability of the substances and subsequently the risk of overdose. Equally important is addressing the stigma associated with addiction. FVCPC advocates for policies that prioritize prevention and treatment by creating an environment where individuals feel supported and encouraged to seek help. We contribute to a culture that values recovery and rehabilitation. In addition to advocacy, we work towards improving access for resources. This includes supporting initiatives that increase the availability of medication for opioid use disorder, MOUD, counseling services, and support groups. FBCPC has been working with the healthcare sector to raise awareness for MOUD services through the Why You Should Offer MOUD campaign. By reducing barriers to treatment, we can enhance the likelihood of successful recovery and consequently lower the risk of opioid overdose. Collaboration is fundamental in tackling opioid crisis or any substance use crisis. FBCPC fosters partnerships with other community groups, government agencies, and healthcare institutions. By working together, we can pull resources, share knowledge, and implement comprehensive strategies that address the crisis. FBCPC has been collaborating with Fort Bend Independent School District and Houston DEA to be a host site for the National DEA Drug Take Back to collect leftover, unused, or expired medication for safe disposal. Coalition also advocates and promotes permanent medicine drop boxes. Lastly, the significance of community outreach cannot be overstated. Coalition has consistently hosted a variety of events, workshops, conferences, symposiums, and forums, serving as a platform for open discussion on substance misuse and its impact. Collaborating with the Houston DEA, Houston High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, HIDA, regional and local government entities, as well as other community-based organizations, FBCPC has facilitated prevention trainings to reduce stigma and raise awareness. Through direct engagement with the community, our aim is to establish a robust network of support and motivate individuals to actively participate in preventing opioid overdose. In conclusion, the opioid overdose crisis requires a comprehensive approach and members of FBCPC play a vital role in driving positive change. Through education, advocacy, collaboration, and community outreach, we make a lasting impact and contribute to the well-being of individuals and communities affected by this devastating issue. Once again, 
Thank you for joining us today to discuss the opioid overdose crisis. Thank you, Payal, and a very special thank you for all of your work building up to today's event and for bringing together so many fantastic voices from across the Fort Bend and the greater Houston area. It's always a pleasure to work with you. We are grateful to each of our speakers today, together doing so much to raise awareness and expand services in this challenging environment. And now we will view the virtual reality simulation portion of this event. Walmart has invested in training their associates, which includes the use of virtual reality. The virtual reality program was developed as a tool to build skills in unique training situations that are hard to replicate in a classroom setting, such as front of store shopping experiences and emergency preparedness simulations. This technology led to the development of non-retail trainings, such as the VR, which we will see next. Let's take a moment to review this training. Dude, guess what I just swiped for my grandma? What? Don't people get strung out on this stuff? Yeah, that's the point. These two industrious young gentlemen have stolen opioid medication for recreational use. Oxycodone, hydrocodone, fentanyl, and heroin are a group of chemicals referred to as opioids. The first three may be prescribed by a medical professional to treat pain, but they can be addictive and deadly, especially if not taken as directed. Heroin has no legitimate medical purpose. Opioid overdose is the current leading cause of death for people under 55. True or false? More than half of Americans have been affected by opioids. Correct. Over 70,000 people died of opioid overdose in the United States in 2017. And millions more were impacted through overdose or misuse. That means that if you have not been directly affected by opioids, someone you know likely has. But not every overdose needs to end in death. Today we're going to teach you to spot the signs of an overdose and administer naloxone, a life-saving medication. Hey, you okay, dude? You don't look so good. Opioid overdoses will slow or stop your breathing. This reduces the amount of oxygen in your body, resulting in pale or clammy skin. The pupils will constrict until they are the size of a pin. The lack of oxygen can cause the fingers and sometimes lips to turn blue, gray, or purple, depending on the person's skin tone. Dude, your breathing is weird. It's too slow. A very serious side effect of opioids is depressed breathing. During an overdose, their breathing will become shallow, erratic, or stop entirely. Oh, Jay. Jay. JJ. 
Wake up, man. Wake up or I'm calling the cops. John! Hey, I'm not playing with you. Are you breathing? Dude, you're not breathing. Jonathan! Loss of consciousness is the final tell of an overdose. If you suspect someone is passing out because of an overdose, you should scream their name and try to wake them to see if they will respond. As with any emergency, the first thing you should do is call 911. 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, my, I need help. Naloxone is a life-saving medication that can reverse opioid overdose and restore breathing. There are several types of naloxone available, and all of them provide a life-saving medication in the event of an opioid overdose. In the example today, you will see the nasal spray Narcan administered. If you happen to have the injectable form, make sure to hold the needle straight and inject it into a muscle, like the shoulder or the upper thigh. First, peel back the packaging to remove the device. The device has a plunger and a nozzle. Hold the device with your thumb on the plunger and two fingers on the nozzle. Be careful not to accidentally spray the naloxone before you are ready. The device only has one dose, so don't test it out. Put the device right up their nostril until your fingers are touching their nose. Press firmly on the plunger to release the dose of naloxone. Come on, buddy. Wake up. Come on, man, wake up. After you administer naloxone, place them in the recovery position and wait for help. The person who overdosed needs immediate medical care. You should stay with them until help arrives in case they lose consciousness again. Another dose may be necessary. There you go. There you go. All right, that's it, welcome back. Great job. When people think of overdose, they usually think of recreational opioid use like we saw here. This is a stereotype. And unfortunately, there are many situations that lead to accidental overdose. Let's take a look at other situations that can lead to accidental overdose. Mom? 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 Mom, wake up. Mom? Again. My mother is blacked out. Uh, I think she's had a heart attack. Send an ambulance. Please stay calm. I'm going to check her vitals. What's her name? Blanche. Blanche, I'm here to help you, okay? Is that hers? I'm gonna check her for an overdose. She's got a pulse, but her breathing is slow. Let's check her pupils. All right, stay with me. Uh-oh, they're constricted. With this medication, this may be an overdose. Let's administer naloxone. All right, Blanche, stick with me, okay? One second. All right, I'm just gonna go right up here. The patient took too much of her prescribed medication. She forgot that she took her medication before breakfast and took another dose after breakfast in the event that this had been a heart attack. 
Naloxone wouldn't have been able to treat the heart attack, but it would generally be fine to administer to her without serious complications. Talk to your healthcare provider or check the package insert for possible side effects and additional information. All right, Eugene, got your stuff. Oh no. Eugene took an old opioid medication that he had previously been prescribed for pain. Usually this wouldn't cause an overdose, but he's taking a new benzodiazepine medication. When opioids and benzodiazepines mix, the results can be deadly. Always check with your doctor or pharmacist before taking any medication, just in case there will be a negative interaction with your other medications. Opioid overdose can happen to anyone. You can overdose from opioids even when taking a prescription exactly as your doctor prescribed, which is exactly what happened to me. All right, hotshot. I hope you're paying attention. It's your time to shine. Select the things you should look for when you suspect an opioid overdose. Now, let's review how to administer naloxone. Correct. You have to remove the device from its packaging. It will not do you a lot of good otherwise. Correct. That's how you hold the device. That's correct. You did it. You saved my life. Thank you for knowing what to do in the event of an opioid overdose. Accidental overdose can happen to anyone taking opioids, whether recreationally or even as directed by a doctor. This information can save a life. Opioid misuse is a national epidemic and accidental overdose can happen to anyone taking opioids. It takes an entire community to keep all our members safe from overdose. If you or someone you care about is taking opioids for any reason, consider getting naloxone at your local pharmacy and keeping it on you at all times. No prescription is required and it could save your life or the life of someone you care about. Thank you to the Walmart team for developing this powerful tool. We are so excited to work with you to connect this resource with community members. We want to extend our thanks to all of our speakers and participants for attending this event. We truly appreciate your time and insight. Please reach out to our team, Reiko Mendoza, Vice President, Business Development and Membership, Sean Moore, Senior Manager, Special Projects and Initiatives, and myself, Mia Wallace, Director, Business Development, here at CACA anytime with more suggestions and questions. We look forward to discussing this more and getting your tremendous feedback. Thank you to the Walmart team for developing this powerful tool. We're so excited to work with you to connect this with community members. And finally, thank you so much to our friends at Fort Bend Prevention Coalition. Please visit them and learn more about the amazing work they are doing. We are now through the hour and we will conclude this webinar. I wish you a great rest of your week.